If you don't know what a roguelike is, the general idea is that instead of having linear progression through a story or adventure, every in-game life starts you at the beginning of a randomized challenge, and finally beating it requires the player to get better on every attempt, with a little luck along the way. So basically the exact opposite of Stardew Valley. Stardew Valley allows you to play the game however you want, nothing can ever be missed, and in general, is meant to be relaxing. Until now. The Habu and Tyler have been working for months on a roguelike mod for Stardew, and it's finally out. I've been no-lifing the game and got a pretty good run the other day. I also have tons of tips to give out, so this will be a bit of a guide as well. Also, if you didn't know, Habu has three competitions going on for this mod right now. First, the person to get the deepest floor. Second, the fastest run beating the final boss, which is on floor 47. And third, the first person to beat hard mode. The hard mode reward has already been claimed, but the other two competitions continue until September 18th, and I plan on giving stiff competition. Now, if you've played a roguelike before, you know that we're going to be dying a lot. And of course, the first few runs went pretty much as expected. Now I'm dead. I don't... <laughs> what do I do? They explode! I feel like this is just GG. But finally, I got a run going. I'm gonna take you through this run, talk through all of my decision making, and give you an idea of what to expect from the game. So on the first floor and after every boss, you'll come across these tavern floors. More will be here later, but for now, there's just a shop. We have so little money that really the only thing we're doing here is choosing our weapon. Personally, for a safer run, I'd choose the sword for a wider area of effect when you attack. For a speed run, the dagger. There's a few kinds of floors that will give you a problem if you only have the dagger, in which you would just reset in a speedrun, but it does overall do more damage. I choose the sword here because safety is going to be my focus of this run. I suppose you could pick up two weapons, but I usually don't bother. So moving on to floor two, this is what most of your floors are going to look like. A mines floor with enemies that you need to kill to move on. Each enemy killed drops gold for you to use at the shops, and you'll also want to keep an eye on the crates since they can have gold or gems in them, which also exist to be sold for the most part. I don't have too many notes for this first section of floors, other than note that every single rock will be a rock crab, there are no regular rocks. And personally, I'd consider slimes the most dangerous enemy, if only for the slime to debuff. Now what really gets this run off the ground is on floor 4, I run into the dwarf, who basically trades you an item that can be found in the next shop for half of your HP. I always take this trade early on, since it pretty much just costs one of your three starting fried eggs to heal. And I get... Shadow Dagger. That's a game changer this early on. Most people generally consider daggers the best weapon type in this mod, since critical hit builds are especially powerful. So once you get to floor 5, say hello to the first boss, Goobins. As I understand, this is a bit of a Terraria reference, but as I've never played it, it's a slime. Now for this boss, there is a strategy where you can cheese it by holding it onto the right wall, but I didn't do that here because I didn't know yet. Instead, I adopt a strategy that I call the Slappy Runny, where I slap and then run. Now normally what makes this boss difficult is the extra slimes that spawn when you deal damage. However, since my dagger is so strong for this point in the game, the boss goes down with very few hits and not many babies spawn. I managed to get out without using another fried egg, so I'd consider that a pretty strong start. So this next tavern floor is where the runs are made. You have a new service here, every tavern floor will now have a perk for you to choose. And almost all perks fit into three different kinds of runs. Tanking, damage, or investment. The options I were giving was a tanking perk, 10% less damage, and a damage perk, extra crit power. And an example of an investment perk would be like gems selling for 30% more, or ore nodes giving one more gold, something that'll help you in the future, but not so useful now. If you start in any of these builds, I recommend committing to them. Personally, in deep dive runs, I always invest towards tanking, as the hardest part of the game is the beginning, and I value taking more hits as opposed to killing faster. If you take the investment route, you're making the early game a bit harder for yourself, but once you hit floor 30 or so, you're probably swimming in money, so if you can reach that barrier, you're set. As for attack damage builds, those are probably best saved for speedruns. Any extra damage perks you take is at the trade-off of survivability. But of course, you'll do more damage, and you'll go faster. 
So here I take the shield perk and make a note to commit to tankiness. I don't have a ton of money to use, but luckily I already have an adequate weapon and I still have the two fried eggs. So I spend all of my money on a health boost, going from 50 up to 75 health. Already I'm much tankier than the average run at this point. Moving on, we're now in the ice floors of the mines. The main worry here is getting swarmed, since dust sprites spawn in droves, ghosts will follow you everywhere, as will bats. I tend to start every room by running straight to a safe-ish corner and then slowly working through the floor. And I make a note to prioritize using the special attack of the dagger on ghosts, since they have such a high knockback. On floor 8, we get our first challenge floor. There's a couple of different kinds of these where the better you do, the better the prize, where the top reward is 40 gold ore and a diamond. Which comes out to a whopping 1,350 gold. A game-changing amount. I always welcome challenge floors and deep dives. This specific floor has us knocking out waves of enemies, and I believe knocking out five enemies should get us the best reward, which we do. These can usually be accomplished as long as you have a good weapon. The next two floors are pretty uneventful, leading us to boss number two, Ark the Skeleton Mage. And the music is... Yeah. This is the boss with the largest learning curve in my opinion. It has two distinct phases, four distinct attacks, and spawns minions halfway through the fight. Tips? The biggest killer in this fight is the Bone Vortex. Nope, stop laughing. The only thing that gives this attack away is the sound cue. You can stop for a moment and then knock the bones out with your sword. This also goes for the bones that Ark throws at you, but that's not fully reliable. I'd just dodge instead. The explosion attack won't deal damage directly, but it will freeze you. And be careful if you're using the club's special attack, because sometimes you won't have enough time to run away. At half HP, the skeletons will be spawned, and they'll shoot you if you get too close. Hitting them will stunlock them, and if you specifically have the broken trident dagger, it'll one-shot them with the special attack. Most other weapons will take multiple hits. I also try to kite the boss away from the small skeleton so it doesn't interfere while I take them out. After all the skeletons are down, Ark is vulnerable again and you'll have a repeat of phase one. Just now it'll use attacks more often, and the explosion has a much larger radius. You'll have to start running the moment it starts charging. While this boss has a big learning curve, it becomes one of the easiest once you have it down. Once again, we have a new feature in the tavern. You can pay the fortune teller 500 gold, or 15 max HP, to get a wacky effect. Usually in a serious run, you probably don't want to touch this. It could help, or it could kill your run immediately. For reference, one time I got an effect where I took an occasional bleed damage, and I also got hit for 1.5 times damage. There was no upside. This time, I got something a little bit better. Both I and enemies will move at double speed. This is a trade-off of enemies being able to resist knockback a lot more, but if enemies moved slower than me to begin with, they now move a lot slower than me. Also, in general, combat will be more tense. Luckily, I got another great tanking perk, increasing my HP by 25. And thanks to the diamond I got on the challenge floor, I had enough money to buy two more health increases, three life elixirs. By the way, life elixirs say they heal 90 HP. They're actually a full heal, and this is true in the vanilla game as well. So it's pretty much always worth the money if you have at least 100 HP. And finally, I took the ossified blade. It's heavy hitting, but it is slow. I also don't think I've mentioned it yet, but there's a full heal pool in every tavern. Moving on, ladies and gentlemen, Shadow. This is one of the luckiest floors you can get. This is the only random chance boss in the game, and it's also the easiest. Avoid a pretty simple attack, knock the blue shot back at it, win. I usually keep a sword on me just for this fight. Even the rusty sword works just fine, and it's kinda hard to hit the blue ball with daggers. Also, this is a great example of a situation where I gain from double speed, since the boss doesn't move at all. And your reward for winning is a prismatic shard. So our normal floors are now the lava areas of the mines. My personal biggest threat here are the Shadow Brutes. Since they resist knockback, I really need to play it safe to not be hit by their 2 times speed, usually by standing diagonal to them so they'd have to change direction to hit me. And a few more uneventful floors and then we're at boss number 3, Telesto. Again, I hear this is inspired by the Wall of Flesh from Terraria. I don't know. A bit simpler than the skeleton, Telesto just has three attacks and that's it. They're just crazy. First, it'll shoot a ton of rebounding shots that if they hit you, will inflict freeze. 
immunity makes a huge difference in this fight. The thunder strikes are really only a threat if you get frozen, otherwise they're easy to dodge. Finally, Telesto will explode after being hit with about a 5 second cooldown before it can explode again. If you get hit by the explosion, you'll get the burn debuff, which both reduces your movement speed and your defense. And then at half HP, it'll start just shooting out a lot more projectiles. The strategy here is simple. Summon up bullet hell skills from playing Toho and go into attack right after it shoots the projectiles. At least then you're guaranteed to not get hit by a spawned in free shot. The main key to this fight is consistency. Getting hit a few times won't kill you, but this boss is an absolute endurance test. After defeating Telesto, I was given the choice between extra crit chance and more immunity. I chose the crit chance, first of all, because I believe I have enough bulk at this point, getting two of the best perks for it already, and immunity is just a lot less useful after Telesto. At this point, it's time to start building damage. Now, the thing about the prismatic shard that we got earlier is that you can either sell it for a huge 2,000 gold, or you can save it in hopes that you'll reach the forge floor after boss 5. Me personally, I chose to sell it here, because a lot of money this early in a run makes a huge difference. I used the ton of money I have to get 3 life elixirs, the dragon scale boots which have the largest defense buff in the game at plus 7, an aquamarine ring for crit chance, and the yeti tooth sword as it gives plus 4 defense. Pretty much making me impossible to kill now. Also if you're wondering why I didn't get more HP upgrades, it's because I've already bought them all. And I forget to heal at the spring. Honestly though, it doesn't matter. With this setup this early, I'm not joking when I say I'm nearly impossible to kill. It would take some heavy lack of attention to my HP bar to die. We're also in the Skull Cavern now, which personally I consider easier than the Lava Mines, if only because there's no Shadow Brutes. Serpents will only be a problem if they swarm. Also, you can kill the Armored Bugs now. On floor 22, we get another challenge floor, and it's my favorite of all an egg hunt on a custom map. Same rule as the enemy waves earlier, the better you do, the more you earn. I believe you need 18 eggs to get the diamond reward. Somehow, despite the fact that I am ridiculously fast, I only got 15 and got the jade reward. Third best. Not a big deal since at this point our money has already been made with that prismatic shard. The very next floor is boss 4. Kavrag the Dragon Prince. It just has three very simple moves. A flamethrower, a random fire spray, and a charge. The problem here is that while it's easy to understand and avoid hits, the hits that do connect deal massive damage. While the fire won't be dealing as much, if you get hit with the charge attack, it still dealt almost half of my HP despite all of my defense. A few tips, try to get three hits in between each attack, then back off. If you're too close, you won't have enough time to back away from the flamethrower. And the easiest way to deal with the charge is to use the block special attack with the sword. Or if you're feeling brave, counter it with the dagger special attack. Otherwise, it's a very simple fight. Try to stay below it. The hitboxes are weird on top. My next perk is between speed or crit power. Thing is, I know what the next boss is. So I chose speed. Around this point, I try to buy out the three life elixirs every single time, as long as I can still afford a weapon. I take the Dwarf Sword, as it's a direct upgrade to the Yeti Tooth, also having plus 4 defense. Lastly, I buy three salads to further contribute to my tank build. I also want to note that I sold all of my gems except my Ruby, as the Forge is coming up soon. I probably should have kept the Aquamarine for extra crit chance, and another good one to keep is Topaz for the defense buff. All others I'd probably just sell. Now, we're going through the dangerous mines, starting with the bug floors, of course. Your biggest threat here are the squids. They deal by far the most damage and can sometimes move unpredictably with double charges. Otherwise, just keep in mind that the bugs will turn when you hit them now. There's no reason to take that easily avoidable damage. Floor 26 is always a forge floor. Being ready for it is your gate to beating the second half of the game. Save your extra rings if you get them and make sure to bring a few gems. If you get a prismatic shard somewhere after Telesto, you might want to save it for the enchant, otherwise it might be better to sell it. If you're unable to make use of this floor, you're really going to feel it. I load my dwarf sword up with extra attack and two extra defenses. On floor 28, we have our first instance of a non-tiered challenge floor. Here, you either win or lose. I need to kill all of the enemies in one minute, and there's a lot more enemies than normal. Even with my recently enchanted weapon, 
I barely won, and the prize was... You are kidding me. Wow, I wish I didn't try. <laughs> the boots I already had. This becomes a real possibility once you get this deep. The very next floor is boss five, Otis the Hive Mother. I don't know if I just really suck at this, but this boss is both a strict damage and speed check. Basically, every few seconds, the boss will fly to a spot to try and lay an egg. If you don't disrupt the boss in time, the laid egg will spawn a few bugs that will chase you, and this will quickly snowball into an entire swarm if you don't keep on top of everything. The small bugs also cycle through a few different modes, some of which being green for speed, orange for damage, black for a random debuff, and red for explosions. They never cycle outside of red. The key to this fight is properly juggling defeating the occasionally spawning bugs and hitting the boss. A trick that I actually recently learned after this run is if you have a slingshot through one of the challenge floors we haven't seen yet, you can use it to cancel the egg layings. After that boss, it's all downhill from here. Otis is my cause of death 9 out of 10 times. The two perks I get are reflecting damage on hit, or deadly critical hits. I decided to take a second to think about it. I'm not really doing a critical hit build, but reflecting damage only works if you get hit, which isn't exactly the goal. I go over to the shop while I think. Life elixirs and an emerald ring is all I can afford. I go heal, and head on down. I... didn't choose a perk. Immediately, I get a treasure floor and get the mermaid boots. While it's not as much defense as the dragon scale boots, the plus 8 immunity is too much to pass up. Our regular floors in this section are the worst in the entire game. The dangerous ice mines. I hate these, and they didn't even include the stick bugs. Okay, so the biggest threat is easily the putrid ghosts. They can inflict the nauseous debuff, preventing you from eating for two minutes. That alone can be a run killer. I usually hide until the effect is over, to be honest. Past that, this is a reskin of the ice mine floors, which means enemies are abundant just like back then. So you'll be dealing with tons of spiders, which, while not the most dangerous enemy, kinda just piss me off. And immediately on the next boss fight on floor 35, and it's a bee. While I don't see this boss as much of a threat compared to the last one, it hits like a truck. Keep an eye on your HP. I kinda just come out swinging and then back up during the spike shot attack, and then I go back in when it's done. Extra bees that spawn aren't too much of a threat, and sometimes I'll even take the weaker hit from them just for the invincibility frames. This should be a quick kill. After that, my perks in the next floor are reflection again and plus 10% damage. I take fighter, not really a hard choice for me. I'm pretty much kitted out at this point. I just take my life elixirs and a protection ring. You'll start getting food with buffs in the item shop at this point, and something I didn't know at the time of this run is that the food buffs actually last forever. They still work like normal though, you can only have one food buff and one drink buff at a time. And we go! Now we're in the dangerous lava mines, and once again I have to deal with the shadow brutes. Nothing else is really much of a threat, the snipers stay back and are predictable, the shamans don't really go for the kill much, and slimes just have a lot of health, that's about it. Now while floor 38 was a regular floor... PRISMATIC SHARD! Okay! I just got a prismatic shard from a barrel. Okay, I'll be saving that for the next forge. On floor 40 we see another new challenge room. The King of the Hill Volcano. This is actually the only way you encounter any volcano related content in the mod. Basically, you stand on a spot for about a minute while enemies spawn around you, and repeat two more times. The earlier you encounter this floor, the more dangerous it is. Being this late in the run, we have ways to deal with all the enemies, so it's no big deal. Although note that if you're deep enough, just an absolutely ridiculous amount of enemies spawn. And at that point, it's basically a heal every five seconds floor. You get an item for finishing, and the only way to fail is to die. I got a lucky launch for winning, which I never actually ended up using, because again, I didn't know the buff would be permanent. The next boss is on floor 41, Ozul the Shadow King. I kinda wanna know how they chose these names. Similar to the dragon, the pattern is easy to read, but it hits like a truck. Just like in the moon fight, it'll explode every once in a while after you hit it, with a larger area of effect at half HP. It has a sound cue attack where it shoots out a volley of arrows, but personally, I don't think there's enough time to react if you're close to the boss, 
so just try to time them off and back off if you think it's coming. It'll occasionally spawn like 50 shadow snipers, which worried me in the moment, but they despawn after shooting once. Of course, getting hit by the sniper shots inflicts blind like usual, but that's not the debuff you need to watch out for. Instead of shooting arrows, sometimes the boss will shoot a wave of green shots that inflict the Jinxed debuff, lowering your defense by 8. This can easily put you in one-shot territory if your defense isn't high enough, so back off if you have the debuff. And this once again is another endurance test. This boss has so much HP. I beat him, and we move on. My next choice of perks was between Reflect yet again and Leech, which is spelled weird, but apparently it still works. Leech is by far the best perk in the game at this point. It has since been nerfed. Easy yoink. I go and pretty much buy out all of the healing food in the shop and move on. Now we're in the final biome, the dangerous Skull Cavern. If I'm honest, it's probably a lot easier than the three biomes that came before it. All enemies are similar to ones in the regular Skull Caverns, the biggest change being the Royal Serpents have more HP and bigger hitboxes. I did get another Forge on Floor 44, although I don't think this one is guaranteed. I took this opportunity to enchant my Dwarf Sword with Slime Killer, which, as you may be thinking, is not an enchant that exists in the normal game. I inquired and it turns out this is actually the only enchant that was added into the mod, and Haymaker was taken out, because all it does is give extra hay. I complain when I get it, but I won't be complaining for long. Floor 46 gives us another challenge floor. This one is a shooting range similar to the one in the Stardew Valley Fair. The more waves you beat, the better the reward, with five waves being the best. I kinda just try to shoot lower than I think I have to, since the bottom half of the monsters is the only spot where the hit registers. I got the second best reward with the ruby. Finally, Floor 47 has the final boss. Nodeth the Extinct, Destroyer of Worlds, Killer of Runs. I found it pretty easy. I don't know, man. It's just kind of standard bullet avoiding. The only attack that deals a lot of damage are the ones with large fireballs, and those are the easiest ones to avoid. It gets a new attack at half HP that spawns with a lot of bombs, but they don't deal a ton of damage. I wouldn't fret. There's also two lava lurkers that chill in the lava. Imagine that. Just try to not stay in the same spot for too long. And dead. Well, this run was the first non-developer run that beat the game, but I wasn't done yet. I have to get as deep as I can. Thing is, every regular floor from here on out is the exact same. There is damage scaling to account for being stronger as you go on, but as Habu has said himself, he wishes he said it a lot higher. It's not really noticeable. So from here on out, assume that on every tavern floor I grab whatever perk gives me more damage, I buy the three life elixirs, and move on, because that's pretty much all I can do at this point. The new content isn't over though, because we have one new boss. Floor 53 gives us Goobins Juniors, a slime stack version of the Goobins fight. It's identical outside of a lot more damage, and every few hits, the top of the stack will fly off, bounce around, and burst, spawning a bunch of slimes. Honestly, I have the slime killer enchantment. I eviscerated this dude. After that, I continued to delve deeper, grabbing yet more perks. Eventually, one allowed me to reroll the shop, giving me six life elixirs every shop instead of three. Each boss from here on was identical to the original with a bit more damage and a bit more HP. I felt like I was coasting. I lowered my guard, nothing could kill me with dozens of life elixirs in my inventory. Until... This thing's still scared. 54! It poked my belly! I need to heal, I need to heal, I need to heal. <laughs> they do so much damage. Oh my gosh, who just followed? Done. Oh my goodness. Get me out of here. Do I have to kill all the others? I do. Uh, as you can see, I am... An entire... <gasps> oh! A bug. One bug. I flew too close to the sun. Hubris got the best of me. I thought I was invincible. The bug disagreed. Thus ended my run on floor 77, which has since been beaten. I got another run all the way up to floor 233. In this run, I died to the Shadow King in one hit due to the Jinx debuff that I warned you about before. That run took two and a half hours. And this run too got beaten. And then beaten again. 
Will I try for a deep dive again? Maybe. You can understand why I hesitate to dedicate possibly four hours to a speedrun of a mod, but I might. In the meantime, I've been holding the speedrun record, which requires a lot less time devotion, currently at about 30 minutes. And you don't get to see that run. I'm keeping my secrets. I do implore anyone who's interested in this mod to give it a try though. It is insanely fun and I've put probably like 50 hours into it just in like the week it's been out. And like I said, that competition doesn't end for like another week or two after this video airs, so go for it. The more competition, the better. I'll also say that Haboo already has plans to update the mod, which I'm super excited about. I could see this mod being one of the best of all time. Thank you all for watching, I'll see you in the next one, and goodbye.